Southern trees bear strange fruit. Blood on the leaves, blood on the root. Black bodies swinging in the southern breeze, strange fruit hanging from the poplar trees. This poem, written in 1937 by Abel Maripal, illustrates how commonly placed lynches were in the South. According to researchers at the Tuskegee Institute, there were over 3,900 victims of racial terror lynching between 1877 and 1950. Reports of these murders sometimes were featured in the back pages of newspapers, but one lynching, that of a Jew, in 1915 made headlines. In 1913, Leo Frank, the superintendent of the National Pencil Factory in Atlanta, Georgia, was accused and convicted of murdering 13-year-old Mary Fagan. The conviction of Frank, a man of Jewish heritage, was later commuted from the death penalty to life in prison by then Governor John Slayton. This decision from the anti-Semitism of some Southerners creating an outrage led to an encounter between Frank and the angry mob and intent to carry out a form of justice. As a result of this case, Georgia politician Tom Watson called for a revival of the Ku Klux Klan. Jewish leaders retreated from public office and race relations in the South were explored in a national and international spotlight. Oh, hello. Welcome to the Tennessee newspaper here in Nashville. I'm in the archives conducting some research on the Leo Frank case. I find it amazing that this case is over 100 years old and still making headlines. On April 24th, I was invited to a ball game, but due to the weather, I decided to go to back and work. I did see Mary Fagan shortly before lunch when she came to pick up the pay. The next day, nearly the wa watchman was arrested. He was the one that found her body. On May 1st, Jim Conley, one of the two was taken in. Someone saw him washing blood from her shirt. Of course I was interviewed as well. I was the last person to see her alive. On May 23rd, my husband was indicted for the murder of Mary Fagan. The trial started on July 29th. Sitting in that courtroom and listening to people defile the moral reputation of my dear Leo was insufferable. I admit, I had a breakdown when Prosecutor Hugh Dorsey insinuated that Leo was philandering down at the factory. Leo would not bring such an embarrassment to the Frank or Selig families. Throughout the summer of 1913, the Leo Frank trial made headlines each day. State opens case against Leo Frank. Jim Conley tells an amazing story. Leo M. Frank, ready to tell his own story to the jury. The newspapers of Atlanta exploited the sensational nature of Mary Fagan's death. One newspaper, the Atlanta Georgian, owned by William Randolph Hearst, was known for wanting its readers to recoil in shock. When the three-week trial had come to an end, the Atlanta Constitution's front page headline read, Frank convicted, asserts innocence. It had taken four hours for the jury to find Frank guilty. I was not allowed to be present when the verdict was read. Judge Leonard Rowan did mob violence, should have been an acquittal. I waited at the verdict in my cell, sorry, my friends and family. At 5.25 p.m., a friend came broke the news. My God, even the jury's influenced my mob law. I was as innocent as I was one year ago. My lawyers, Luther Ross, Sir Andrew Arnold, would file a motion for a new trial. The sentencing was held in secret the next day. I hurried to the courthouse when Summer brought word, but Leo was already being returned to the jail. So I accompanied him. Now it's not a time for Leo to be alone. I'm very worried about his health. He has lost 60 pounds. Tom Watson and his publications, The Jeffersonian and Watson's Magazine, used shallow journalism to prey upon the prejudices of rural Georgians. His editorials created a fanatical following. Although the trial made headlines daily in newspapers throughout Georgia, it was not until Leo Frank had been convicted that word spread to northern states and it became a national discussion. Leo Frank is innocent. My husband did not commit this heinous crime. Here, please take these leaflets we have prepared in my husband's own words, evidence that proves him innocent. During the next two years, more than a dozen appeals were filed by Frank's defense team. All were denied. When the US Supreme Court rejected the final appeal, Frank's execution was set for June 22nd, 1915, but Mrs. Frank was still fighting for her husband's life. June 7th, Mr. John M. Slayton, dear sir, I trust you do not trespass upon the conventional, but can a woman steadfastly regard form when the life of the one most dear to her is in the balance? When I address you in the matter of my husband, Leo M. Frank, I come to you, Governor Slayton, and beg of you to grant our plea. Give us your commutation to life imprisonment, so that when the truth shall be known, as it must be, my husband may glory in his exoneration. I pray that you will not leave him to die horrible and ignominious death for a crime of another. In his last day of office, Governor John Slayton commuted the sentence of Leo Frank from death to life in prison. Slayton spent many hours poring over the files in the case and had become convinced that Leo Frank was innocent. 
Judge Rowan urged compensation, great serious doubts about Frank's guilt. Conley's attorney, William Smith, wrote to Slayton. Smith had become convinced of his own client's guilt. Knowing his decision would not be popular, Slayton made plans to leave the state immediately upon his successor being sworn in. He also ordered that Frank be moved from Fulton County to a prison work from in Milledgeville, for fear that a mob would overpower the guards. My dearest Lucille, my hopeless letter finds you well. My days during Milledgeville are bearable, and my work only takes a few hours each day. The sunshine brings warmth and joy to my heart, unlike those dark days in Atlanta. This is the 16th letter I've written today, writing to you. Each day helps to feel closer to my family. On your next visit, if you'd be so kind, please bring some more beach snack gum, toothpaste, and writing pads. Big bars would be greatly appreciated, but no sweet crackers. They are much too rich. Your husband, Leo. July 16th, on the Wyatt Roberts, my dear Mr. Roberts, that not for this, written to you is not the fault of heart. You know I treasure your friendship and kindness. It's been a pleasure for me to know you. I appreciate you accompanying me down here. You are in greater danger than I thought possible. It is still officially consummated as the main thing. My health and strength are returning, and the work that I've been assigned is not overtax me. The officials here are kind and humane. With best wishes to you, your wife, and your daughter, and regard to Sheriff Mangum, I'm cordially yours, Leo and Frank. Shortly after 11 p.m. on July 17th, my husband's throat was slashed by William Crean with a butcher knife. If not for two other inmates and their medical training, he would have bled to death that evening. August 4th, dear mother, just a few words to let you know that I'm doing well and my dear Lucille is one on the job. We let the nightmares go and the danger stick her place. Dear Lucille is one moving forward in the daytime. Just after 10 p.m. on August 16th, eight vehicles arrived in Milledgeville. 25 armed men, calling themselves the Knights of Mary Fagan, cut phone lines and surprised the guards to enter the barracks of Leo Frank. I did not resist these men. We drove down the dark roads to Marietta. As they put the new storm in act, a sight of stadium innocence, I only had one request. Leo's wedding band was returned to me several days after his death. I accompanied his body on the train to Brooklyn, New York for his burial. In the decades that followed, the Leo Frank case was studied and written about many times. But on March 7, 1982, Frank Ritter, Jerry Thompson, and Robert Sherborne, journalists here at the Tennessean, wrote an article that brought attention to the case once again. They had the opportunity to meet with 83-year-old Alonzo Mann, a worker at the pencil factory. He signed an affidavit that admitted he saw Jim Conley carrying the limp body of Mary Fagan. Conley had threatened him if he told anyone. Mann had confessed this to his parents years before, but was urged not to come forward. This led to the October 1982 application for a pardon. March 1986, the Board of Pardons and Paroles granted Leo Frank a posthumous pardon based on the state's failure to ensure his safety. The pardon does not officially clear Frank of the murder. This encounter a century ago between Frank and an angry mob led to the expiration of race relations in the South, inspiring two conflicting legacies. Some of Frank's lynchers joined the original members of the Ku Klux Klan, which had all but faded out after Reconstruction. On the top of Stone Mountain, they formed the modern KKK, partly in Mary Fagan's honor. Its mission would expand from just intimidating Southern blacks to spreading hate against Jews, Catholics, and others across the country. A fledgling organization found submission in the Frank case, the Anti-Defamation League, become a powerful defender in civil rights and social justice across the United States and continues this day. Pastoral scene of the gallant South, the bulging eyes and twisted mouth, since a magnolia sweet and fresh, to the sudden smell of burning flesh. Here's the fruit for the crows to pluck, for the rain to gather and wind to suck, for the sun to rot and trees to drop. Here's a strange and bitter crop. 